Welcome to Free Thoughts, a podcast project of the Cato Institute's Libertarianism.org. Free Thoughts is a show about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it. I'm Aaron Powell, a research fellow here at Cato and editor of Libertarianism.org. And I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. Our topic for today's episode is a book you may have heard something about because it seems like everyone who talks about books like this is talking about this book and that's Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century. Joining us today to talk about it is Scott Winship. He's the Walter B. Riston Fellow at the Manhattan Institute. Welcome to Free Thought, Scott. Oh, thank you for having me. So a lot of big books on topics like this come out pretty frequently from academics and don't get anywhere near the attention that this one is. So why, why is Capital in the 21st Century tearing up the charts? So I think first it needs to be said that uh, that the book is is a really important book and, and it reflects 15 years of work that uh, that Piketty has put into developing all of this histor- economic historical data that um, that really deserves to be uh, to be lauded. I think uh, uh, Larry Summers had a rev- has a review out now that says it's Nobel Prize worthy, and I think that's right. Um, but that's not why it's getting all the attention, which is in some ways I think the more interesting thing. Uh, it, it's getting attention because inequality has been uh, such a hot topic in D.C. and uh, to some extent on the on the Eastern Seaboard. Um, uh, you know, ever since Occupy Wall Street, I think um, it's been it's been in the news. Uh, President Obama um, made it a, a big theme of his reelection campaign in 2012, and then even afterwards, it was in his uh, second inaugural. Uh, the Center for American uh, Center for American Progress uh, has started a new think tank that's devoted to inequality. So it's it's been this uh, issue that uh, that that hasn't gone away. Uh, I think it actually will go away. Maybe we can get into that later. Um, but his timing was uh, was perfect, and and it also has this um, uh, veneer of uh, of sort of having a scientific uh, explanation for why. Uh, capitalism is is doomed to uh, to eat itself. Uh, that I think is is attractive to uh, a lot of folks out there, unfortunately, um, and and so that's that's a big part of it as well. I think. And so you get this. See, look, I told you I was right the entire time, and that seems to be what a lot of people on the left are saying. We've been talking about inequality, and here you go, noble, worthy work. And then people on the right, you know, seem to have to hate it. But I think Larry Summers made this observation that it's a very complex book that deserves, as you said. Uh, a lot of respect, especially his dad on inequality over the period of time in the story, but it starts to lag at different times. I, I guess uh, is is the consensus. Not, it's not the consensus. It's interesting, but flawed. Uh, I, I think that's becoming the consensus. You had this interesting dynamic where a, a few people got it, got a hold of it. It was released in France uh, last year, actually. So it was floating around out there. A couple of people had had review copies. Uh, I think I read that Branko Milanovic, uh, who's at um, the Luxembourg Income uh, Study in the in City University of New York, uh, was actually in Europe and found it in a bookstore and, uh, and did this actually really good twenty page review of it. Um, so there was a little bit of a build up where you kind of were hearing things uh, about this, you know, important book overseas that's going to be coming out in English. Um, so so you had a first wave of reviews that that were mostly from people. On the left, and they were they were kind of these fawning reviews, uh, people tripping over themselves to uh, tell everyone how important this book was. And, and what it did is it set up this uh, this reaction where uh, if you are on the right or if you are kind of a skeptic about the importance of inequality uh, and and policy is your business, you had to buy the book yourself. And, and it got to the point uh, where where pretty much everyone in town who studied uh, income. Uh, uh, or mobility or, or topics like that. You, you sort of had to have a review of the Piketty book and it was almost a running joke. Oh, where's your, where's your Piketty review? Um, now I think as people have worked through the 700 pages, which <laughs> which I'm not sure many of those <laughs> initial reviews uh, that, that folks made it too far into them, um, you're getting a more nuanced picture of it. Um, and, and interestingly, it's uh, – it's it's a bipartisan nuanced picture in a lot of ways. For a long time, you had uh, I think people like Matt Iglesias of Vox, you know, said, "What's the conservative response to uh, to Piketty?" And uh, 
I think the the skeptical response to Piketty has has actually come from uh, from people who are right of center, like myself, but also, as you mentioned, Larry Summers' uh, review is is pretty skeptical. Uh, even someone like uh, like Brad DeLong, who's an economist at Berkeley. Um, you know they're they're trying very hard uh, uh, to to sort of uh, to, to criticize I think uh, but put it in the best light. Um, but I think a lot of the economic arguments um, have have been uh, have been shown to uh, be problematic by an increasing number of economists. Um, James Galbraith is another an, another economist who's certainly politically left of center um, who had some important criticisms. Uh, Danny Roderick, I think, at Harvard has had another uh, similar review. So, before we then get into the details of those economic arguments, maybe you can give us kind of the big picture. Like, mm. what is what is the scope of Piketty's argument? Yeah. So, uh, so Piketty essentially uh, most of the book is is devoted to kind of laying out these extremely long term trends in things like. Um, Wealth as a share of national income and uh, the fraction of income going to uh, to workers versus to owners of of capital of wealth, uh, and and that's the real I think intellectual contribution of the book. Now, going th throughout the length of the book, he he weaves in this argument about how uh, how capitalism tends to uh, produce ever rising inequality, and and so the. The technical argument is essentially that um, with with low economic growth, um, that is going to tend to increase uh, wealth as a share of national income. What do we mean by wealth? Right. So that's a that's a great question. Um, economists uh, tend to think of capital as uh, as assets, uh, wealth that produce a stream of income um, pretty regularly. Uh, and uh, Piketty's definition is a little bit different, where he essentially is treating uh, is treating all assets as capital. So, uh, so one of Summers' critiques is that in, in the United States, uh, the biggest form of wealth is actually owner occupied housing uh, that generates a stream of income in the sense that people who own their home uh, benefit from the shelter that it provides, where they would be paying rent for it if they didn't own the home. Uh, but it's a little bit of a different way of thinking about <clears throat> uh, capital as, as economists tend to talk about it. So, so for Piketty, wealth is essentially uh, any any asset uh, that that folks own, not just producing, not just a machine that produces something, but any anything. That's right. Yep, yep. Housing is is uh, is is wealth. Um, uh, you know, retirement savings in in theory is wealth. Um, and so, what Piketty shows is. Uh, if you kind of assume that savings rates uh, uh, kind of are just set uh, that they don't respond to things like economic growth or wealth concentration, the percentage of of how much you're saving of your income. That's right. Yeah. For some time period. That's right. The amount of annual income that you that you save and uh, and invest. Um, and that assuming so assuming that doesn't change depending on how good the economy is. is it? That's right. So the big assumption. That seems there a is, big assumption. Yeah. No. There. That, and that's the first of a number of big assumptions. So uh, so yeah. He kind of takes the savings rate as just this thing that's out there. Uh, um, that isn't affected by the other the other moving parts in his theory, um, and if you accept that, then then lower economic growth in a country uh, will tend to will mathematically um, produce more wealth as a fraction of national income. So I mean, the, the intuition is uh, if you if you're saving the fix, the same amount uh, over time, uh, but economic growth is slower. Then savings are going to build up and build up, and wealth is going to is going to build up, and it'll become a bigger share of national income. Now, most of us, I think, would would say, well, if wealth is becoming a bigger fraction of national income, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It you know it sort of sounds like a good thing if a, if a country is getting wealthier. Piketty even worries about about that actually that uh, that that having uh, more wealth for the amount of income that you have. Uh, even if inequality in wealth or in income uh, isn't growing, that that somehow is a dangerous thing. So he kind of has a little bit of an anti-consumption. You're a little bit too rich for your own good type of. Yeah, yeah. He sort of uh, uses this language about you know it could be socially disruptive, and uh, it, so it really uh, interesting uh, kind of skepticism and wariness from him, I guess. But so then his, his next the next piece of the argument is if wealth as a share of national income is growing. Um, and the uh, the return to wealth uh, doesn't fall. 
then what that will do mechanically uh, is it will increase the share of income that's going to capital, to wealth holders, uh, to, to non-workers, uh, although people can be workers and, and own, own wealth at the same time. Uh, and so there's the second big assumption, right? As, as wealth, uh, as a fraction of the of, of income rises, uh, Piketty says that uh, the the return to wealth won't fall correspondingly. Now, you know, economic theory uh, tells you that as as wealth uh, as wealth rises, as the, as uh, assets accumulate um, because of diminishing returns, the return uh, to to assets. Should decline uh, if you've got uh, if everyone you know someday owns their own robot or something, uh, uh, then the value of the next robot is going to is going to shrink, um, and actually labor workers will become relatively more valuable um, for for production than than robots are. So wait, let's go back a little bit as because I'm not an economist, uh, and many of our listeners aren't. So I'm going to try and imagine this uh, the thesis here. I think it's very important to understand it in a in a more applied. Non-abstract, non-abstract way. So, sure. a guy owns a factory. Yep. Um, so, rich, rich guy. That's a product of capital, um, and so he gets wealth. That's an item of wealth that people and he has workers who work on the, the machine, and he makes money off of that mostly through the value that he gets as a capitalist. Correct. And that's right. And so. That the workers get a wage, and they're not getting anything on the return on the capital because the wage is not wealth; it's income. That's right. Yep, that's right. Yeah, that, so human capital, uh, mm -hmm. kind of the the amount of investment um, uh, that that you do in yourself and your skills, that's that's not counted as wealth in, in the book. And then, and so the idea is that he will increasingly get the, the the capital, the the factory owners and everyone like that will increasingly get more money from that, while the wages themselves stay pretty stagnant, and therefore. There, they will become richer while everyone else become is about the same. That's right, and and the key assumption is that uh, the value to uh, to an owner of a factory or the owner of a robot uh, or some machine that uh, that's producing a stream of income for for the person that owns it, that that doesn't become any less valuable as as. As capitalists accumulate more and more stuff, so if you've got one factory, the factories start to break down, don't they? Uh, they do, and and uh, and and Piketty uh, uses a lot of um, net concepts, which uh, which account for depreciation for the fact that you've got to uh, replace stuff, um, and that's that's part of the uh, the problem with his economic argument. I think Summers points it out pretty well, um, but yeah, the idea is if you've got one factory. Uh, that returns uh, has a rate of return of four percent or something. Uh, you get another factory that's going to have a four percent rate of return. You get a thousand more factories. There, are, it's still gonna, each of them is going to have four percent rate of return. So, uh, so I think that argument has been uh, that assumption has been challenged uh, by a number of economists, and I think uh, rightly so. Some those returns just keep going and keep going. And that's keep right. Going. Yeah, yeah. Theory would predict that uh, that as capital accumulates, um, as assets accumulate, that the return will decline uh, and you'll sort of reach a new equilibrium uh, where where the rate of return is lower. Um, so – and then uh, because of this weird definition of, of wealth, uh, Summers I think is great on this. So if you think of, um, of owner-occupied housing again as a, as a form of uh, capital by, uh, by Piketty's definition, um, the income that's produced from the house that you own, as I said, is really not Income that lines your pockets. It's sort of money you would have had to spend uh, if you were renting. Um, that uh, you know that doesn't get reinvested uh, in, in any way. I mean, it's it's, it's no entirely consuming. You anything, right, yeah, exactly. so entirely there's consuming it, there's yes. nothing you can't build uh, a new wing of your house mm. uh, from the income stream that you, you save by not having <laughs> to pay a renter in an alternate universe. Yes. Exactly right. Uh, so right, so 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 if you assume that the that the returns to wealth don't diminish as as wealth accumulates, that's mechanically going to send more national income to uh, owners of assets um, rather than to workers, um, uh, and, and in turn, because capital income, uh, the income that that comes from owning wealth, is more unequally distributed than labor income, that's going to increase income inequality. So so you've got more income going to capital instead of to workers. You've got more income uh, going to uh, the richest income earners um, rather than the, the the poorest income earners. Uh, and by the way, uh, unless everyone 
uh, who has uh, – who, who owns wealth, uh, spends it all. Uh, if they reinvest any of it, then wealth inequality will also increase over time. Sort of a snowball effect. That's right. Yeah. So it's kind of a – it's an inequality triple whammy. It's sort of a, a perfect storm, which I think is – Part of the appeal, uh, you know, for folks on the left who are trying to get people to really be worried about inequality, it, it, uh, it's an account for why, you know, in every way, uh, we're we're just doomed. <laughs> uh, you just published a cover article in the National Review about this, and the the art that goes the the cover image is of Karl Marx holding a Starbucks coffee. I believe <laughs> right. it's yeah. like a millennial <laughs> with Karl Marx buds, yeah. with a shirt that says "Still Wrong." Right? That's right. <laughs> it's a good it's a good picture. And so a lot of – I mean a lot of the, the rhetoric around Piketty is he's – this is like neo-Marxism um, and and so that seems to be like why – people are saying that might be why it's so appealing to people on the left who are Marxists all along and other people are using this as a way to attack him. But is it is it accurate? Is this is this Marxism repackaged or is this something totally different? So it's an interesting question. I, you know, I, when I started uh, initially working on the piece, uh, I was inclined um, – to to not certainly not play that up at all, um, because you know he's he's certainly he's from France. I don't think actually we've mentioned that he's a French economist. Uh, he's very clearly you know in the social democratic mode for for Europe. Uh, you know, well to the left by American standards. Um, but I sort of thought, well, I don't know how fair it is to you know to to talk about this as Marxism. Um, although you know, it depends on I think what your definition of Marx is. So, for your philosophically inclined uh, listeners, you know he he does really uh, give credence to to Marx's view that there are these contradictions in capitalism that uh, will will push uh, capitalism towards uh, t towards essentially self destruction. Um, and he he says that Marx was wrong. Uh, but the reason that Marx was wrong is that uh, he couldn't foresee um, that there were that economic growth would essentially boom, kind of right after actually uh, capital came out. Um, and Piketty now is saying, but now actually uh, we're in a period where where growth has slowed, and so uh, his arguments become more applicable today. Um, so philosophically, I, I think he does have uh, this sort of neo-Marxist perspective about capitalism. Politically, you know, he's he's gone out of his way to kind of say he's not a political guy. I'm just an academic economist. I think that's what all academics uh, describe themselves as, whether <laughs> whether it's accurate or not in, in any one case. Um, but you know, in 2007, he was a prominent advisor uh, to the the presidential candidate of the French Socialist Party, uh, who I think is shares a kid with the current president um, of France, who's who's a member of the Socialist Party. Um, he's he's pretty active in politics back in France, uh, so you know I I think it's pretty fair the the, the policies he's arguing for uh, are are pretty extreme. Uh, the one that's gotten the most attention is a global wealth tax, um, which he acknowledges is not very practical, but he thinks this is the sort of thing that will save uh, capitalism from itself. Um, but he also has this proposal for an, an eighty percent top income tax rate, which he would apply. To income over five hundred thousand uh, dollars, so you know a good chunk of uh, of doctors in America, you know that with that 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 uh, tax rate would bite into what they make. Um, so I, I I think it I think it kind of is a fair charge. Uh, his collaborator uh, Emmanuel Saez is an economist um, at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. Um, another guy who you know pot potentially both these guys are going to win a Nobel Nobel Prize for the, uh, for their inequality work. Uh, but it's pretty clear that he, you know, also uh, I, I don't know anything about how radical his politics are. I suspect they're not they're not incredibly radical, but he's certainly an advocate for the view that inequality uh, is essentially a, a modern day crisis that uh, that we've got to do something about it. Um, and uh, I, I've seen him present uh, presentations where the the last slide sort of says, you know, unless Americans uh, can can. Essentially, be educated about how much inequality we have. They'll never uh, worry about it. And I, I thought that was just an incredibly revealing uh, slide. It's it could, because he and and Piketty are kind of in the business of education, uh, in a sense of uh, of telling people how much inequality we have and how it's worsening. And uh, but not uh, interestingly, uh, why we ought to care about any of that. In in your overview, you just gave us. You raised a lot of problems with the assumptions he makes in his model. But what 
before we start, we t we'll talk about all those those issues and your criticisms of him. But before we do that, what did he get? What does he get right? Like, mm. what's you know, if even if all that is wrong, is there still what in the book is worth reading or Nobel worthy? Yeah. So the just the amount of of work and creativity uh, and and brilliance uh, that that has gone into. Um, Assembling these very long-term trends, so you know, in France, he's got uh, trends going back to the 18th century um, uh, on things like the amount of wealth as a fraction of national income in a country, uh, in um, the share of income that's going to uh, to capital or, or, or to workers. Um, so that's a, a major accomplishment. The um, the income inequality figures. Uh, Probably until about 2000, uh, whenever anyone talked about inequality in the United States and most other countries, the the best we could do, we kind of had this this measure called a Gini coefficient, uh, which which essentially compares every possible pair of people, uh, compares their incomes, uh, and 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 measures the overall level of income inequality in a country. But it turns out that the major story since the 1970s has actually been the extent to which. The very top, the top one percent, and actually even the top one half of the of the top one percent, uh, the extent to which they've uh, income has become concentrated uh, at the very top, and we just didn't know much about that at all until uh, Piketty and Saez uh, came along and started assembling um, these uh, these tax return based estimates of of income inequality. Uh, so they did it for the United States. Piketty did it, had done it for France before that and then with other uh, economists around the world. They've actually done it for uh, I think a couple dozen countries. Um, so a real, uh, a real uh, contribution to the field. Um, a number of them are also working on wealth concentration figures, uh, which interestingly uh, the ones that Piketty cites actually contradict the idea that, uh, that wealth inequality is growing. In the United States, um, uh, so all of this work in putting together these series has involved a ton of work working with this tax return data, digging up archival sources, uh, and it really is. Uh, I, I would agree with Summers that it's it's it is Nobel worthy. Um, that's correct. I mean that that it, I think that there is a lot of pushback, especially this idea that the. You know, the super rich are pulled away from the incredibly rich mm. uh, to a higher degree than in the last three decades than ever before. That the one percent or the point, even the point one percent, that yeah. they're making more money than they ever made before. I think that's right. I mean, interestingly, I, I one of my big critiques of of their work is about their income concentration data, and and I don't uh, I don't dispute that that income concentration has risen, but I think probably their data. Uh, overstates how much it's risen by quite a bit. Um, I know less about the you know 18th century French uh, uh, wealth to income ratios. I suspect um, that those ones are probably on on more solid footing. But. And, and at any point does he? And this is something that comes up about inequality in general. Um, does he sort of seem to assume it's a bad thing? Does he, does he ever come out and be like, just per se? Because this is the the great question that yep. people on the right have. A discord with people on the left when you say there there are people who believe that that rich people should be made, brought down even if it doesn't help poor people out just by itself that would be a good thing to diminish some people's well being just because they're doing a little bit too good compared mm. to everyone else does he ever seem to address that issue no I mean it's I mean it's striking because you know, this book is seven hundred pages long and uh, it, and to the extent that he talks about why. Uh, rising inequality is something that we ought to be concerned about. It's mostly in the context of uh, being uh, socially disruptive. Um, he talks about it as a threat to democracy in a lot of ways, but but sort of really in just kind of armchair, you know, like uh, can you vague that up for like me? your uncle yeah, would talk exactly. about it. Uh, and uh, you know, I, I don't know your uncle, uh, <laughs> but uh, so yeah, it's it's interesting. It, it's not sort of grounded in literature or uh, or kind of reviewing evidence, uh, which I've spent quite a, quite a bit of time doing. It's just kind of assumed that well, of course, we ought to be worried if uh, if income concentration is higher than it's ever been. Um, he 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 spoke at a few events in Washington D.C. Uh, for a week that the or, or a few events around the country for a week that he was in the United States, and uh, the one that I attended was at the Urban Institute, and I thought there was a uh, unintentionally hilarious tweet um, uh, that I think 
Tim Noah, uh, who's an MSNBC uh, uh, writer, um, tweeted, which said something like, "Is it just me, or is is Piketty looking incredulous that uh, that his American audience keeps asking, you know, about why we should worry about inequality?" And I think that's right. I think I think it's sort of a strange question, you know, to for him to for, receive. In France, he probably doesn't <laughs> get it that much. And I think I had heard that he had never left France before this trip or something like that. Yeah, so he had definitely bragged about uh, how little he had left Paris. Uh, so so not even France. He sort of uh, wow. Uh, yeah, and he, and in the book he has uh, a little vignette about uh, his – he was at MIT for uh, for a little while and he sort of talks about how he didn't really uh, like it there. He didn't like American economists and it's funny. You're sort of I think seeing the uh, scorn returned in, in some ways in some of the more recent uh, economic critiques of him. Well, what does the literature say on this? Because this, this idea that there is something – that income inequality is destabilizing, is bad for democracy, is one that I think a lot of people do mm. hold, even if they're not as concerned about it as Piketty might like them to be. Yep. Um, does does the literature support that? Does it contradict that? Do we know? I don't think we know. There's, there hasn't been a ton done on it. So the American Political Science Association, uh, which is the professional association for uh, for political scientists um, in the U.S., put out a report uh, I think it was 10 or 12 years ago where essentially they said, you know, we don't know the first thing about how inequality is related to political or democratic outcomes. And since then, there's been some more work. Um, uh, there, there are studies that have looked at the extent to which the policy preferences of voters who are middle class or poor or rich, uh, the extent to which those preferences are reflected in votes. Um, and uh, and, and there are a couple of those studies that have found that legislators are more responsive to the preferences of the rich. Uh, however, you know there, there's there's another major study, a book that was funded by the Russell Sage Foundation, which is you know a pretty left of center uh, foundation, does fantastic work. Um, but this book essentially failed to replicate it. Um, its its primary conclusion was, you know, it's hard to find. The policy, the differences in policy preferences between rich, middle class, and poor. Yeah, there's pretty much none. The last time I checked this out. Yeah, they're very, is, they're, they're similar, and they don't always go the way that you might expect. Um, it's not necessarily the case that rich people are more anti-welfare, for instance, than uh, than middle class people. Um, the other th interesting uh, line of research that you see and that gets cited a lot um, is uh, there, there's a book by uh, Darren Asimoglu. Uh, and James Robinson called When Nations Fail. Uh, that's about inequality and democracy, but it focuses on uh, on, on sort of developing countries, emerging markets, and uh, and even they, you know, the, the Center for American Progress had them over to uh, to talk about their book, and they they've tried to uh, extrapolate this argument about um, often non democratic countries uh, that have a lot of inequality uh, that we ought to. You know, draw lessons from them about why inequality is bad in places like the United States, which I think is uh, is ludicrous. Um, it also seems like they're making comparisons. You know, like to make comparisons to Gilded Age type of thing, or even maybe Piketty would do pre-French Revolution yeah. aristocracy, and this is exactly why it's problematic. Yeah, yeah, that's. But, but it might not be. It, that's the question that I'm asking. It seems to me that the first obvious answer for why the 0.1 percent would be pulling away. Or world markets. Yep. I mean, the, you can sell an iPod to everyone now, yep. and that would mean that that you, originally, when Americans were the only people who could have afforded that in 1955, you could make a lot of money, but not that much money. But now you can make an amazing amount of money. That would be a first answer. Market's gone from hundreds of millions to billions of. Yeah, that's right. So, so on on both those points uh, about uh, Piketty, kind of hearkening back to. Uh, to to French Revolution, yeah, stuff. French Revolution and early labor strife. You know, chapter one of the book starts out with uh, a contemporary account of a miners' strike in South Africa, where uh, where there was violence. I think uh, I think there were some workers that actually were killed, and essentially pivots from this and says, you know, is this is this what the future has in store? Uh, he talks about Haymarket Square uh, and uh, and wonders, you know, whether we'll see a return uh, as as inequality rises back to those earlier levels. Whether we'll see a return to the sort of labor strife, without any recognition that uh, as a nation we're uh, we're something like ten or twelve times richer than than we were back then. I mean, there was a reason why uh, why labor was so much more popular back then, and and why people were willing to uh, you know face. 
private uh, private security uh, guards and and uh, and even take bullets in some cases um, when uh, when there was a lot more poverty than there is today. Today we're uh, you know one of the richest nations in history. Um, I think our middle class is at something like the ninety fifth percentile of uh, of world income according to Bronco Milanovic's stuff. Uh, so there's this real absence of uh, uh, of context. Well, that makes it seem with the Marxist point because. And I know Piketty has said that you know, I like capitalism. I think it has many good things that you know, trying to sort of get people to stop paying attention to the Marxist comparisons. But this fatal flaw thing, uh, you know, I don't think Marx would have said himself that he hates capitalism. Mm. He just said it would have been a, a it was divorcing workers from their value, and there's going to be a comeuppance if if you kept divorcing people from their value, and they will revolt. Yep. And and that's what. We'll, and so if he opens the the book with a discussion of workers' revolt, he's definitely putting himself more into this classic Marxist camp that something in capitalism is going to spin out of control, and then the comeuppance and the doomsday. That's right. And it's back. and it's so striking because he he follows up this discussion of uh, you know invoking labor violence with. A review of these early economists who made these sweeping predictions about the future, and who just completely got it wrong. So, so Marx, who he uh, who he does, uh, you know, he does show that he was he you know he can't deny he was he was completely wrong. But also, you know, Thomas Malthus, uh, David Ricardo, he kind of goes into detail about these grand theories these guys had and what you know we can draw from them. Uh, the whole time acknowledging that that they were just badly off. And then making you know this other grand argument himself, it's kind of it's kind of like wow, you uh, it's it's a fair amount of hubris to uh, think well these guys, uh, Ricardo and Marx got it wrong, but uh, but maybe I'm going to get it right. In your article, you go through a fair number of ways you think he misinterprets data, or that the data that he chooses leads in potentially an inaccurate direction. I was wondering if you could go through mm -hmm. some of those because I was struck by there were quite a lot of them. Yeah, so I, my biggest uh, my biggest critique of of his data is, it relates to his income concentration figures, and so for instance, the numbers that everyone cites because they're the most striking of of the various charts that he has um, show that the share of income received by the top one percent rose from ten percent in nineteen eighty uh, to twenty four percent in two thousand and seven. Uh, so, so more than doubling, uh, pretty dramatic increase. Um, that series, excuse me, has a number of uh, of problems with it, um, and I would say, kind of in, uh, we'll, we'll work up to some of the more technical ones. I mean, the 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 most basic problem is that this is all income derived from tax returns. Um, so, if income isn't taxable uh, and doesn't show up on tax returns, then it doesn't show up in their data. Now, what that means. Is that transfers, for instance, um, uh, whether it's things like unemployment insurance, uh, means-tested programs like wealth, uh, like uh, welfare, food stamps, um, that doesn't show up in the data. More importantly, uh, Social Security um, and Medicare don't show up in the data. Now, uh, his data isn't broken out by age. Uh, so, what's happened since 1980? Well, we've seen the boomers. Age and retire, uh, and and so we're we're seeing an increasing share of the population uh, that doesn't have earnings that uh, they they rely on social security. They may receive um, retirement benefits, uh, which do show up in the data, uh, although in lumpy ways that probably overstate how much income concentration there is. Um, so right off the bat, you're you're. You're making invisible to the data, you know, the main way that we actually try to mitigate uh, inequality in the country. Um, that's also true of taxes. You know, we have progressive taxation, um, uh, whether you like it or not. Uh, it is a way that uh, that we deal with inequality. Um, all of their figures are before taxes are taken into account. Um, another uh, problem with their data is that the the basic unit they're looking at is not a household um, and it's not an individual person. It's a tax return. And so what that means is that if I'm a 16-year-old kid who works uh, at a fast food restaurant for the summer uh, or after school during during school year, uh, I file my own tax return. I show up in the data as a pretty low income uh, tax return. Um, similarly, if I'm a college student and I have a work-study job and file my own uh, tax return, uh, so you end up padding uh, the data with a lot of lower income. Uh, what what 
I think is taken as lower income households but which are actually uh, – a lot of them are just dependents who have to file their own tax return. Uh, so, so those those are some of the more basic problems. Um, there are all these technical issues too around measuring income, uh, in particular capital gains. Um, so, if you have an asset that you've owned for a while and then you sell it, the capital gain is uh, the difference between what you sold it for and the, and and what it was originally worth when you when you bought it. Um, or you can experience a capital loss as well if it if it declines in value. <clears throat> the way to think about uh, income that you receive from assets that you own is that kind of year by year you're getting a stream of income, right? Whether you whether you actually see it in the form of a check or or cash uh, depends on if you've sold it or not. But 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 really, even if you haven't sold the asset, it's it is income that's accruing to you uh, behind the scenes. So if I've owned a home, say uh, let's say that I bought a home in. Um, uh, I don't know on 14th Street and you and here in Washington D.C. right after the uh, the riots that happened after uh, the Martin Luther King assassination, you know, housing would have been pretty cheap in that neighborhood uh, back then. Today, uh, if you were sitting on on that housing and sold it, uh, you'd do very well. Uh, the way that would show up in the tax data is as this gigantic lump sum uh, that you received last year. Uh, so it wouldn't show up as kind of well. I earned a little bit in 1969, a little bit in 1970, and over uh, 40 years, you know, it, it added up. You, you see, essentially, the whole 40-year gain show up um, in in one uh, one year's tax return. Uh, so that obviously makes uh, income concentration look uh, look steeper than it is. If the folks at the top who own more assets than others are timing it. Uh, Depending on how the stock market is doing, which which is a very clear pattern that shows up in the data, uh, it's going to make things look even more uh, dramatically higher over time. Uh, and then finally, as if that sort of wasn't enough, if you're say a middle class homeowner um, uh, and you sell your home, but the capital gain isn't big enough to be taxable, uh, which generally it isn't. I think it has to be above four hundred fifty thousand dollars or something like that for a for a married couple. The the gain, not the selling price. Um, then that doesn't show up in the data at all. And so essentially you're counting uh, more than you should all these capital gains at the top and you're not counting any of the capital gains uh, that middle class uh, households are experiencing from, from selling homes. Uh, if they have 401ks and they're kind of slowly building a nest egg, uh, that's all behind the scenes until, uh, until they cash out uh, at retirement. Uh, so uh, – so the way that they treat capital gains also has the effect, I think, of overstating how much uh, income concentration has grown. Um, and then there are so, there are some other technical issues around stock options and uh, corporations, whether whether corporate income shows up on individual tax returns or in corporate tax returns, depending on how tax policy changes. Uh, you know, income pops up at, in different years in different places. Um, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say the, the the person who's really I think done the most on all of this is Cato's own uh, Alan Reynolds, who uh, who's, who's really done important stuff on on all of this. Is that I guess my question then is someone listening to this could say, well, given all of these problems that you've raised and all of these complexities that they seem to have ignored, um, that they were cherry picking their data, mm -hmm. that they they chose the way to measure that would lead to the kind of a picture of a scenario that they liked. But on the other hand, this sounds like measuring this stuff and taking into account all of that would be fantastically complicated. Mm. And so is it is it that they didn't they didn't do the right thing or that it would really be close to impossible mm. to do the right thing, to get the, the data to really get a meaningful picture out of all of this? Yeah, I, I I think it's too soon to say that it would be impossible. It certainly will be challenging to deal adequately, I think, with the capital gains issue in, in particular. Um, and I don't think there was anything nefarious in what they've done. Um, uh, they, they've made a few changes, uh, a small number of changes in response to criticisms in the past. So for instance, originally they were using a cost of living adjustment um, that no academic researcher these days uh, that, that does stuff on income trends, um, if they know what they're doing, they, they, they don't use it. It's, it's essentially the adjustment that's used for federal policy to kind of update tax brackets, to update federal benefits. There's no reason that would track very well with the real world. Yeah, and it's, it's pretty well known that it, it overstates inflation, which then understates 
how much incomes have grown over time. Um, so in response to criticism, they did switch uh, to to a different uh, cost of living adjustment. So it's so it's not that they've uh, refused to acknowledge any problems or, or make any changes. Um, but I will say I, I do think they're kind of uh, they they've been poo pooing a little bit uh, some of the criticisms that I think are really important, uh, both from Alan Reynolds um, and also Richard Burkhauser, who's a who's an economist at Cornell University, who's who's done I think the best work so far tackling this capital gains issue. So what what Burkhauser did uh, was to take a household survey. Um, and link it to a second household survey that had that had much better wealth measures, and so they knew from from the survey the asset portfolio that everyone had, and they took the returns that were typical of different types of assets and essentially assigned them to people as income. So whether or not they sold the asset or not, um, they just gave them uh, what the typical return in the previous year was. Uh, and interestingly, when they did when they did that, they found that rather than income concentration growing between 1989 and 2007, it actually fell. Um, now I think it's too soon to say that 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 that's actually what happened that income concentration didn't grow at all. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's at all too soon to say that uh, that his results strongly suggest that the uh, the way they're treating capital gains is is overstating the rise in uh, in income concentration over time. Um, it also seems like people can <clears throat> manipulate – if you're using tax returns, you've talked about some of them. But there's a lot of ways you can manipulate your tax return hmm. in ways – American charitable deductions. And there's a cap on that. But yep. but Americans in particular are far more charitable than Europeans. And so if you're just looking at that, it's really hard to – to see the income, I would say that's right. And 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 Allen's uh, one of his major points is that you know whenever tax policy changes, and you have some years where there are these huge changes, like in 1986, uh, and other years where there are smaller changes. But you know when you have that much money, the incentives to uh, to figure out how to game the system uh, in perfectly legal ways, uh, uh, so that your income doesn't get taxed, you've got strong incentives to do that. Um, you can shift stuff between. Taxable, you know, so that you're receiving a set of taxable interest, you're receiving tax exempt interest on, say, municipal bonds, something like that. Uh, you can um, change the type of stock options you get so that they're taxed as capital gains or they're not taxed as capital gains. There are a million uh, games like that you can play. Uh, not to mention, you know, things like uh, you know, hiding money offshore and, and actual like illegal tax avoidance. Um, I, I think Alan's got some really important points. Uh, and, but that would that would have theoretically. Um if you're mo mostly trying to avoid taxes, I assume you're probably not trying to overstate your income. Mm -hmm. Then it would it would maybe mean that the actual inequality is higher, unless unless the middle class are doing that too, or or, or lower class than the really really super rich. Yeah, I think I think the issue is whether the changes that have happened since 1986, for instance, uh, have caused a lot of money that was invisible that was kind of hiding. Uh, behind the scenes for I think Alan would say even maybe for decades. So uh, when, when top tax rates were uh, were 90 percent or 70 percent, um, you know, it may be that a lot of the, the top 1 percent of the top 1 percent uh, simply had uh, company cars, a lot of perks um, that didn't show up on tax returns. Uh, if you go further back to sort of the days of FDR, there were I think there were all these issues around uh, trusts, so like the Pew Charitable Trusts, where I worked once, uh, which is a great organization, uh, uh, but you did have a lot of these trusts that people set up as a way of shielding uh, their income from taxation. So Alan's argument is that essentially what's happened since 1986 is that you've had a lot of uh, of tax policy changes, just including uh, lower marginal rates um, that have caused more money to show up um, on. But people were richer in the past, than people right. seem to think. Yeah, yep. interesting. Exactly. You've given us a lot of reasons to doubt these conclusions, especially the predictions that he has for where capitalism and capitalism in the United States is going. But even if the scenario isn't as dire as he seems to think it is, if there's anything right to it, if, if it is the case that more and more of the wealth is getting concentrated in certain sectors and the wages aren't keeping up, and mm. is that – is that troubling? Is that something we should be concerned about? And I mean, what what would be the negative effects, even outside of just like, well, income inequality would increase, but we've already done the kind of so what on that? Yeah. So I I mean, I think 
I think there are two possible arguments that you can make if you're concerned about inequality. I think one is just a normative argument. You can just say that's not who we are. Uh, you know, no one should make more than five hundred thousand um, dollars. Doesn't matter if they're in some objective way, objective way worth it. Uh, we just don't think that it's right. Uh, if you've got poverty in the world, uh, then then you shouldn't have people that are making as much as uh, as our top one percent are. That's fine. Uh, I, I but but I think that's not the argument that you hear from the left, um, and I think partly because it's not all that widely shared. I think uh, in the United States, I think people are pretty tolerant of. Uh, of people like Steve Jobs, um, Mark Zuckerman, um, LeBron James, LeBron James for sure, Oprah. Uh, so, so that's not the argument that people make uh, on the left. The argument that they instead make is is a consequentialist one, and I think that's where they trip themselves up because uh, most people aren't familiar with uh, the research on this stuff. So, I, I had a piece in National Affairs about a year ago, where I spent uh, several months. Um, Reading the literature on whether inequality affected mobility, affected uh, middle class incomes, affected economic growth. In my mobility, you mean people's ability to rise up through. Yes, the I'm sorry. Yep, that's right. Upward mobility from the bottom. Uh, whether it affected democracy, whether it affected uh, financial stability, and you know what I found time after time was either the literature is. Uh, a mixed, um, and I think that's how I would characterize the literature on economic growth. There are studies that find that that more inequality hurts economic growth. There are studies that find that more inequality helps economic growth. Um, uh, there are other areas where I would say the literature is just bad. Uh, so, so that would be my characterization of the literature on inequality and economic mobility, upward mobility. It's it's tended to be. Uh, basic correlations. So there's this thing called the Great Gatsby Curve um, that uh, Alan Kruger uh, uh, presented at the Center for American Progress. He was President Obama's uh, Council of Economic Advisors chair, um, which basically showed that across countries, if you have more inequality, you have less upward mobility. And you know, they they used this to argue that since inequality is rising in the United States, that mobility was going to fall, uh, and it was it was just awful evidence. Kruger is one of the smartest economists out there, uh, and it was it was just this ludicrous argument. Uh, and you do see a lot of stuff like that where people say, "Well, inequality has grown over time, and also this other thing we don't like has grown over time, and the two must be related." It's like, well, a lot of things have changed over time. Uh, so I, I really don't think in any of these areas um, there's much evidence that we ought to be concerned about the consequences of rising inequality. Um, is one of the reactions I got after I wrote that essay was interesting from a pretty prominent think tanker in town whose name I will not mention. Um, but this person said, "Well, you know, I, I disagree with what you found, but to really, you know, answer you, I'd have to go and read all that literature. Like, yeah. <laughs> Don't make me go read all this <laughs> yeah, stuff. I was like, yeah, yeah that's, exactly. what, that's what you'd have to do. Well, yeah, but, uh, but you also have these ideas that inequality is there's a bad for your health, and and then maybe what Piketty is thinking, if we you know take his first chapter, or the first thing in his book, is that people are just going to get really upset about this, mm -hmm. uh, and they're going to revolt. They're going to yep. look at the world and be like, no longer are we getting our fair share, and those people are, and that's what we should be concerned about. Yeah, and I think that's the danger, and that's why I push back on a lot of the stuff uh, to the extent that I do. Uh, it, I think it wins me uh, fewer friends and uh, more enemies. But uh, but the the danger is that um, that we'll do something uh, to reduce inequality that will uh, that will really end up hurting us. Uh, if you had an eighty percent top tax rate on incomes above five hundred thousand dollars, I think you would see innovation. Uh, dry up in to the United almost States. Almost zero. You have no venture capital whatsoever. Absolutely, and uh, and, and so I think I, I sort of closed my review, uh, my essay in the National Review this way. You have you have this weird um, certainty on on the left. So my arguments generally are not uh, of the variety that says it's absolutely the case that I know there's no reason to worry about inequality. Um, it's to say, look, you know, you look at the evidence and. If you're trying to prioritize issues, there's absolutely no reason that you would put inequality first. Um, whereas on the left, you have this certitude. You have you have this idea that we've got to do something about this. It's the defining challenge of our time. Um, 
if we don't, all these bad things are going to happen to the extent that there are costs to uh, reducing inequality. They're small and we can live with them and uh, it's just this complete uh, lack of imagination I think about – uh, respect for what we don't know. David Brooks has this great uh, column from a few years ago, I think, on uh, epistemological humility or something like that. Uh, and, and I think that's really the the stance that we all have to take with some of this stuff. If we uh, if we overshoot and do something that could be harmful, um, uh, that's not going to help the middle class or the poor or mobility or economic growth uh, or democracy or any of that. So. Um, so I, I, I've, I see my own role as trying to rein in some of these arguments uh, and, uh, and I think as the economy continues strengthening, I think the fascination with inequality, at least among the broader population, I think is going is to diminish. Probably not in D.C. unfortunately. But. Well, thank you very much, Scott. And for, for our audience who's listening and maybe has more questions or wants to follow up with you, where can they find you online? Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. Uh, my handle is uh, at Swinshi. It sounds like my Swedish alter ego. It's S W I N S H I. Um, and uh, and I'm at the Manhattan Institute, and our research center here in Washington D.C. is called Economics 21. We've got a, a website there. Thank you for listening to Free Thoughts. If you have any questions or comments about today's show, you can find us on Twitter at Free Thoughts Pod. That's Free Thoughts P O D. Free Thoughts is a project of Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute and is produced by Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.